Christian Council by Fenelon, 12. Unwandering Thoughts and Dejection. 1. Two things trouble you. One is how you may avoid wandering thoughts. The other, how you may be sustained against dejection. As to the former, you will never cure them by sad reflections. You must not expect to do the work of grace by the resources and activities of nature. Be simply content to yield your will to God without reservation. And whenever any state of suffering is brought before you, accept it as His will. In absolute abandonment to his guidance. Do not go out in search for these crucifixions, but when God permits them to reach you without your having sought them, then you need never pass without your deriving profit from them. Receiving everything that God presents to your mind. Notwithstanding the shrinking of nature as a trial by which you would exercise the strength in your faith, never trouble yourself to inquire whether you will have strength to endure what is presented if it should actually come upon you. For all the moment of trial will have its appointed as sufficient grace that if for the present moment is to behold. The afflictions present tranquilly, tranquilly, and to feel willing to receive them, whenever it should be a will,、uh, the will of God, to best to them, to best to them. Sorry. Go on cheerfully, and confidently, in this trust. If this state of the will should not change in consequence of a voluntary attachment to something out of the will of God, it will continue for ever. <laughs> Your imagination will doubtless wander to a thousand manners of vanity. It will be su- subject to more or less agitation, according to your situation, as the character of the objects. Presented to its regards, regard. But what matter? The imagination, as Saint Teresa declares, is the fool of the household. It is constantly busy in making some bustle or other to distract the mind, which cannot avoid beholding the images which exist. The tension is inevitable. It is a true distraction, but so long as it is involuntary, it does not separate us from God. Nothing can do that, but some distraction of the will. You will never have wandering thoughts if you never will to have them, and may then see with truth that you have prayed without ceasing. Whenever you perceive that you have involuntarily strayed away. Return without effort, and you will tranquilly find God again without any disturbance of soul. As long as you are not aware of it, it is not wandering of the heart, but is made manifest to look to God at once with the fidelity, and you will find that this simple faithfulness to Him will be the occasion of blessing you. It is a more constant and more familiar indwelling. A frequent and easy recollection is one of the fruits of this faithful readiness to leave all wanderings as soon as they are perceived. But it must not be supposed that it can be accomplished by our own labors. Such efforts would produce trouble. Scripture. Scrupulosity. Oh, that's a difficult word. Sorry, scrupulosity 
and restlessness in all those matters in which you have most occasion to be free. You will be constantly dreading lest you should lose the presence of God and continually endeavoring to recover it. You will surround yourself with the creations of your own imagination. As thus, the presence of God, which ought by its sweetness and illumination, to assist us in everything which comes before us in His providence, will have the effect of keeping us always in the tumult and render us incapable of performing the exterior duties of our condition. Be never troubled, then. And the loss of the sensible presence of God, but above all, be aware of seeking to retain Him by a multitude of argumentative and reflective acts. Be satisfied during the day, while I above the details of your daily duties with the general and the interior view of God, so that if I asked, and in a moment, Whether your heart is tempting, you may answer with truth that it is toward God. Though the attention of your mind may then be engrossed by something else, be not troubled by the wandering of your imagination which you can restrain. How often do we wander through the fear of wandering and the regret that we have done so? What would you say of a, a traveler who, instead of constantly and once in his journey, should employ his time in anticipating the falls which he might suffer, or in weeping over the place where one had happened? On, on, he would say to him, on, without looking behind or stopping. We must proceed, as the apostle bids us, that we may abound more and more. First Thessalonians, four, one. The abundance of the love of God will be for more serious in creating us than all our restlessness and selfish reflections. The rule is simple enough, but nature. Accustomed to the intricacies of reasoning and reflection, considers it as altogether too simple. <laughs> We want to help ourselves and to communicate more impulse to our progress. But it's where excellency the precept that it confines us to a state of naked faith, stand by God alone. In our absolute abandonment to Him, and lead us to the death of self by stifling all remains of it, whatever. In this way, we shall not be led to increase the external devotional practices of such as are exceedingly occupied. All are feeble in body, but they shall be contented with turning them all into simple love. Thus we shall only act as constrained by love, and shall never be overburdened, for we shall only do what we love to do. Two. Dejection often arises from the fact that in seeking God we have not so found Him as to contend us. The desire to find Him is not the desire to possess Him. Is simply a selfish anxiety to be assured, for our own consolation, that we do possess Him. Poor nature, depressed and discouraged, is impatient of restraints of naked faith, where every support is withdrawn. It's great to be travelling, as it were, in the air. Where it can behold its own progress towards perfection, its pride is irritated by one of its defects, and this sentiment is mistaken for humility. It longs 
from self-love to behold the self-perfect. It is waxed that is not the soul already. It is impatient, haunty, and uh, of the temper with the self and everybody, everybody else. Sand the state, and though the work gone could be accomplished by our own ill humor. <laughs> and though the peace gone could be attained by means of such interior restlessness, Martha, Martha, why are so troubled and anxious about the many things? One thing is needful, to love him and to sit attentively at his feet. When we are truly abandoned to God, all things are accomplished without the performance of useless labor. We suffer ourselves to be guided in perfect trust. For the future, well, whatever God wills, and shut our eyes to everything else. For the present, we give ourselves up to the fulfillment of His designs. Sufficient for every day is the good, the evil thereof, is the daily doing of the will of God, is the coming of His kingdom within us. At the same time, our daily bread. We should be faithless indeed, the guilty for his and the trust, did we desire to penetrate the future which God has hidden from us. Leave it to him, let him make it short or long, bitter or sweet, let him do with it even as it, sh it shall please himself. The most perfect preparation for this future, whatever it may be, to die to every will of our own and yield ourselves wholly up to Him. We shall, in this frame of mind, be ready to receive all the grace suitable to whatever state it shall be the will of God to develop in and around us. 3. When we are thus prepared for every event, we begin to feel the rock under our feet and the very bottom of the base. We are ready to suppose every imaginable evil of ourselves, but we throw ourselves blindly into the arms of God, forgetting and losing everything else. This forgetfulness of self is the most perfect renouncement of self and acceptance of God. It's the sacrifice of self-love. Will be a thousand times more agreeable to accuse and condemn ourselves to torment body and mind rather than to forget. Such abandonment is an annihilation of self-love, in which it no longer finds any nourishment. Then the heart begins to expand. We begin to feel high, lighter for having thrown off the burden of self, which we formerly carried, we are astounded, we are astounded to behold the simplicity and strictness of the way. We thought there was a need of strife and constant exertion, but we now perceive that there is a little to do, that it is sufficient to look at God with confidence without reasoning either upon the past all the future, regarding him as a loving father, who lead us every moment by the hand. If some distraction or other should he hide him for a moment, without stopping to look at it, we simply turn again to him from whom we have departed. If we commit faults, we repent with the repentance of holy for love and returning to God. It makes us feel whatever we ought. Sin seems hideous, but we love the humiliation of which it is the cause and for which God permitted it. As the reflections of our pride upon our defects are bitter, disheartening, and vexatious, 
So the return of the soul towards God is recollected, peaceful, and sustained by confidence. You'll find by experience a whole much more. Your progress will be aided by this simple, peaceful turning to God. Then, by all your chagrin and spite and the faults that exist in you, only be peaceful in turning quietly towards God alone. The moment you perceive what you have done, do not stop to argue with yourself. You can gain nothing from that quarter. When you accuse yourself of your misery. I see, but you and yourself in consultation. Poor wisdom, that will ensue from where God is not. Whose hand is it that must pluck you out of the mire? Your own. Ah, lost. You are buried deeper than thought, and cannot help yourself. And more, it's a worse loss. Is nothing but a self. The whole of your trouble consists in the inability to leave yourself. And do you expect to increase your chances by dwelling constantly upon your defects and finding your, your sensitiveness by weed of your folly? You will in this way only increase your difficulties, while the gentlest look towards God will calm your heart. It is His presence that causes us to go forth from self, and when He has accomplished that, we are in peace. But how are we to go forth? Simply by turning gently towards God, and gradually forming the habit of so doing by a faithful persistence in it, whenever. We perceive that we have wandered from Him. As to the natural desertion which arises from a, a melancholic temperament, temperament, it belongs purely to the body, and is the province of the physician. It is true that it is constantly recurring, but let it be born in peace. As we receive from his hands the fever, or any other bodily ailment, the question is not what is the state of our feelings, but what is the condition of our will. Let us will to have what is the condition of our will. Let us will to have whatever we have, and not to have whatever we have not. Would not even be delivered from our sufferings, for it's God's place to apportion to us our crosses and our joys. In the midst of affliction, we rejoice, as did the apostle. But it's not joy of the feelings, but of the will. The wicked are wretched in the midst of their pleasures because they are never content with their state. They always desire to remove some thorn. Or to add some flower to the present condition, the faithful soul, on the other hand, has a will which is perfectly free. It accepts without questioning whatever bitter blessings God directs, wills them, from them, and embraces them. It will not be freed from them if it could be accomplished by a simple wish. For such a wish. Would it be an act originating in self and contrary to its abandonment to providence and its desires that this abandonment should be absolutely perfect? Would there be anything capable of setting a soul in a large place? Is this absolute abandonment to God? It diffuses in the soul a peace which flows. As a river, and the righteous in it, which is on the waves of the sea, as there. No, I don't know which chapter it is, but、uh, I think the later chapter. So, anyway, there is a scripture quoted here. 
If there be anything that can render the soul calm, dissipate its scruples, and dispel its fears, sweeten its sufferings by the anointing of love, impart strength to it in all its actions, and spread abroad the joy of the Holy Spirit in its countenance and words. It is a simple, free. And childlike repose in the arms of God. Bless the Lord.